Chapter 40 of Paul, A Herald of the Cross. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Paul, A Herald of the Cross by Florence M. Kingsley. Chapter 40 On the Way to Rome. From Fair Havens to Phoenice is but four and thirty miles, sir said the master of the Alexandrian wheat-ship Artemis, staring thoughtfully out to sea. "'This is no place to winter in,' he went on, glancing with a frown at the rocky headlands off their weather-bow. "'We get every wind that blows here except the Estesians. I am owner of this ship as well as master, and I am willing to risk her and the cargo as far as Phoenice. But it is for you to say, sir.' The Roman centurion Julius, in command of a cohort and charged with certain prisoners of state on board the Artemis, followed the eye of the master. "'I'm no sailor, good Polybius,' he said at length, somewhat dubiously. "'But if we must winter hereabouts, Phoenice is surely preferable to yonder desolate place. If you think it safe, let us get under way at once.' "'Sirs, I crave your attention.' The centurion turned. "'Ah, Paulus,' he said, with a certain deference in his manner, at which the sailor stared open-mouthed. "'What wilt thou?' "'If we loose from this harbour, I perceive that the voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only to the landing and the ship, but also to our lives.' The captain laughed contemptuously. "'Who is this convict?' he inquired with an oath. "'Who will also navigate the vessel for us?' The centurion made him no answer. He was looking thoughtfully at the prisoner. "'This harbour is most incommodious, even unsafe, good Paulus,' he said argumentatively. "'Surely it will be better to push on to Phoenice, which is less than a day's sail.' "'The fellow is a Jew, and therefore a coward,' roared the master of the vessel with a great oath. "'Let him hold his tongue about matters concerning which he has not been asked.' By the body of Bacchus, do I not sail to good Artemis every year for full two months after every beggarly Israelite has taken the land? At this moment, sir, there is a south wind blowing, fit to fan a lady's cheek. Twill waft us to Phoenice before sundown. Then let us loose and away at once, said the centurion, turning away with an air of decision. The Artemis was a large, staunchly built vessel of about nine hundred tons burden, rigged after the fashion of the times with a stout but clumsy mast, to which was fastened the huge square mainsail on a yard as long as the vessel itself. From the bow projected a second mast, raking far forward over the water and rigged with a triangular foresail. The stem-post of the bow ended in a rudely carven image of the goddess whose name the good ship bore, while below and on either side were painted two huge staring eyes, by means of which the vessel was supposed to be better able to look the wind in the face. The Artemis sat deep in the water, for she carried a full cargo of wheat beside her two hundred and fifty passengers and a crew of twenty men. At the lusty cry— all hands ahoy! The ample decks became a scene of the liveliest confusion. The anchors were weighed with much tugging and shouting, the great sails hoisted, and the unwieldy craft slowly gathering headway in the light south wind began to draw away from the land. Closely hugging the shore, she sailed smoothly along, towing her boat a cable's length behind it, having been deemed unnecessary to hoist it into the davits for so short a run. "'How now, Jew?' sneered Polybius, planting himself in front of the manacled prisoner who had ventured to challenge his wisdom. "'Does the goddess carry that precious chain of thine softly enough to please thee?' Paul lifted his eyes thoughtfully to the heights of the Cretan Ida, beneath whose shelter they were now sailing. A prudent man maketh no boast of his running until he hath laid his finger upon the goal, he said with a shadowy smile. What make you, good master, of yonder cloud on the summit? Body of Bacchus, bawled the sailor. 
made of furies but the imprecation was never finished it seemed on a sudden as though the fury so lightly invoked had seized the luckless vessel in their grasp and were hurrying her on to certain destruction so swift and so fierce was the descent of the hurricane that there was no time to furl the great mainsail through a smother of blinding mist and boiling surge the hapless artemis staggered onward her heavy masts tugging and straining fearfully beneath the unwieldy mass of wet canvas fetch the boat shouted the master perceiving from the momentary lull that the vessel had run under the lee of the island of clauda with the help of the less terrified passengers this difficult task was at length accomplished but now it was discovered that water was rising rapidly in the hold it was too evident that the frightful straining of the masts had opened the seams she must be undergirded quoth the captain and may the gods be merciful twice thrice the great cables were passed under the leaking hull and knotted fast across the decks then ensued a desperate struggle to lower the main yurt with its huge sail this was happily successful the ship was hove to with her right side to the wind and thus secured rapidly drifted beyond the danger most feared at the moment the perilous quicksands of Sirtis. the day was now far spent and night moonless and starless shut down over the boiling sea the prisoners were secured aft while the soldiers and sailors huddled together in the waist of the ship many of them prayed wildly invoking their favorite gods with noisy supplications and extravagant vows but their futile clamor was swallowed up in the loud monotonous chanting of the shrieking winds and the hurtling waters towards midnight one of the sailors crept from his place and made his way along the slippery decks to the place where the prisoners were crouched beneath the shelter of the bulwarks putting out his hand in the thick darkness he touched the rough wet cloak of the man he sought art thou afraid paulus the spirit of god moveth upon the face of the waters murmured the prisoner as if thinking aloud who hath measured the waters also in the hollow of his hand who stretched out the heavens like a curtain who layeth the beams of his chamber in the waters who maketh the clouds his chariot who walketh upon the wings of the wind o lord how manifest are thy works the earth is full of thy riches as also is this great and wide sea my meditation of him shall be sweet i will be glad in the lord and is this also the unknown god of whom thou didst speak in athens asked the sailor who art thou i am onesimus once a slave in colossi and look you i escaped from my master taking with me ten gold pieces which i stole from his strong-box i tell ye this because i know that thou art a holy man and because death stares me in the face and i am afraid can thy god save then paul preached once again the message of glad tidings to the repentant slave and to the soldier who was chained to his right hand the two hung upon his words forgetting the night and the tempest and the yawning deeps below when the first faint beams of morning dawned the slave onesimus cried out with joy lo i believe but the soldier shook his head a strange tale he said it hath helped to while away the night but i see not how it can help us in our present plight the day which had now fully dawned seemed half smothered in the murky cloud rack which scudded rapidly overhead as far as the eye could reach the sea was rolling in immense surges white with foam the ship still drifted west by north from clauda the water sweeping completely over her at times it was evident that she must soon founder unless something could be done to lighten her all hands were accordingly called and a part of the cargo was heaved overboard on the third day the situation appearing even more desperate the great mainyard with its mass of torn canvas and tangled rigging was cut away the fury of the storm abated slowly during the days which followed but the vessel now little better than a dismantled leaking hulk drifted helplessly broadside on in the sweltering seas a despairing apathetic silence gradually settled down over the doomed vessel no attempt was made to navigate the wreck no rations were served out 
nor even asked for, no one spoke. For twelve days and nights the death angel had hovered over the Artemis, and the three hundred famished, helpless wretches on her decks cowered dumb beneath the terror of his unseen eyes. Yet there was one man among them who was calm and confident amid all the horror. After long fasting, Paul stood forth in the midst of them and said, Sirs, ye should have hearkened to my counsel and not have loosed from Crete. Then would ye have been spared this harm and loss. And now I exhort you to be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but only of the ship. For there stood by me in the night an angel of God, whose I am and whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must stand before Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all who sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer, for I believe, God, that it shall be even as it was told me, howbeit we must be cast upon a certain island. When they had heard these words, the soldiers and sailors were not a little encouraged, for they were ready to grasp at any hope. Even as a drowning man will clutch at a floating straw, Moreover, there was something in the pale face and shining eyes of this man which inspired them with confidence. He hath himself the look of an immortal, they whispered one to another. As for Polybius, he declared to Julius the centurion with one of his outlandish oaths that he believed the man was an oracle. Unless, he made haste to add, he's a sorcerer and hath raised this tempest because we refuse to follow his words. If I thought that, by Bacchus, I would leave his carcass overboard in a twinkling. Aye, the skies would be clear then, and then the wind would fall. Look you, good centurion, if this man be great criminal, the gods will follow us in anger, till we shall appease their wrath by his sacrifice. But the centurion frowned. Thou art sadly lacking in wisdom and discretion, my master, and that in more things than in the sailing of thy vessel. I warn thee to let the man be, for he is under the protection of Rome. About midnight of the fourteenth day, the keen ears of the sailors distinguished above the howling of the tempest the sullen roar of breakers dashing upon a rocky coast. Orders were at once given to heave the lead. The soundings were reported to be twenty fathoms. "'Heave again, my lads!' shouted the master, straining his eyes through the darkness. Fifteen fathoms, sir!' "'Aye, aye, there be breakers. I see a smother of foam not a quarter mile ahead. Drop the stern anchors, all four of them, or we shall drift broadside on.' At no time of this fearful voyage had their situation appeared so hopeless. Drenched with the driving rain and blinding spray, their ears filled with the thunder of the hungry breakers in imminent danger, so they thought, of dragging their anchors. It is perhaps not strange that at this moment of frightful peril the brute rose uppermost in the breasts of the sailors. "'Let us take the boat,' muttered one of them, "'and get us to the shore if we may. There is no need that all should perish, and yonder rascally soldiers will seize it in the morning.' In pursuance of this cowardly design, they prepared to lower the boat into the sea, under cover of dropping the bow anchors. But the keen ear of Paul had caught a word or two, and he at once comprehended their plans. Turning to the centurion, he said quietly, "'Unless these sailors remain in the ship, ye cannot be saved.' Without a word, three or four of the soldiers who were standing near drew their short swords and cut the ropes. The boat fell off into the sea with a great splash and drifted off to the leeward in the darkness. As the first faint beams of morning shone in the eastern heavens, Paul besought them all to take some food. This is the fourteenth day, he said, that ye have continued fasting. Wherefore I pray you to take some meat, for this is for your health. Not a hair shall fall from the head of any of you. When he had thus spoken, he took bread and gave thanks to God in presence of them all, and breaking it he began to eat. Ay, ay, master, cried one of the sailors, we will do even as thou sayest, for if thy God save us not, we assuredly be dead men. 
After all had eaten, they righted the ship by casting overboard what remained of her cargo. Then hoisting the tattered remnant of the foresail and cutting anchor cables, they ran the ship toward the shore, intending, if possible, to thrust the vessel into a certain depression in the unknown coast, which they took to be a creek, but which was in reality the narrow channel which runs betwixt the island of Salmonelta and the mainland. When the disabled Artemis struck the rough water caused by the current of the channel meeting the inrolling waters of the bay, she ceased to answer to her rudders and drove violently on to an adjacent sandbank. Here the hull soon began to go to pieces under the action of the waves. "'What are the prisoners, sir?' said one of the soldiers, approaching his superior officer. "'As thou knowest, we are accountable for them with our lives.' that they may not now escape us nothing remains to be done save to put them at once to the edge of the sword not so exclaimed the centurion do not we owe our lives to the sagacity of one of them loose them and let those that can swim fling themselves into the sea and so get to land if they are able as for the rest writes luke some clung to spars and others to pieces of the wreckage and so it came to pass that all escaped safe to land. Drenched, bruised, faint, and chilled with the cutting blasts of the raw November wind, the shipwrecked company yet had abundant cause for thanksgiving, for not one of their number was missing, and now the inhabitants of the place, which proved to be the island of Melita, began to gather at the scene of the wreck. A barbarous folk, Luke calls them, but not devoid of human sympathy for they at once set to work to build fires, that the sufferers might warm their benumbed bodies. Paul, eager as ever to work for others, was among the most active in collecting driftwood and dried firs roots for this very purpose. As he cast an armful of fuel upon the flames, a viper leapt out from the smoke and fastened upon his hand. Behold! cried one of the islanders, catching his neighbor by the arm. This fellow must be a murderer. He hath escaped the sea, but vengeance suffers him not to live. They stared at the man with great eyes, as he shook off the venomous beast into the fire. Presently, one whispered, he will be swollen, then he will drop dead. But after they had watched a long time, neither of these things came to pass. They changed their minds. Assuredly this viper pitten is a god, for no man hath suffered the like and lived, no, not within the memory of the oldest of our tribe. And of this they afterward became the more convinced, for it was told them how Paul healed the father of the Roman governor of the island, one Publius, at whose house the centurion Julius and the chief passengers were hospitably entertained. The Roman had lain desperately sick of this fever for more than seven days, quoth their informant, who had himself witnessed the miracle. Those of us who attended him thought verily that this last hour had come. Then this man, whom they call Paulus, entered into the chamber. He first looked attentively at the sick one. Afterward he lifted up his eyes toward heaven, and uttered some of the words in a strange tongue. Next he laid his hands upon the man, and bade him rise up, which thing also he did with ease, my friends, for he was perfectly healed of his disease. When the fame of this miracle had gone abroad throughout the island, others who were sick came and besought Paul, and he healed them every one. Now when the winter had come to an end, it became necessary to continue the voyage, and this centurion determined to accomplish, by means of another Alexandrian wheat ship, the Castor and Pollux, which had wintered at the island. All the inhabitants of Malta, as many as been healed by the hand of Paul, and those who had been taught by him, mourned and wept when the day of parting came, especially since they beheld him once more chained to a soldier of the guard. These good islanders brought gifts in abundance, clothing and food and many other things which they hoped might prove a comfort to the prisoner in his captivity. Thus the travellers set sail from Malta, followed by many prayers and tears. After a prosperous voyage they arrived at Syracuse, where they tarried three days. From thence, writes the historian, we fetched a compass and came to Regium, 
and after one day the south wind blew, and we came the next day to Petioli, where we found brethren, and were desired to tarry with them seven days, and so we went towards Rome. End of chapter 40《Chapter Forty One of Paul, a Herald of the Cross. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Paul, a Herald of the Cross by Florence M. Kingsley. Chapter Forty One Ready to be Offered. The little town of Appi Forum, twenty-seven miles from Rome, was crowded, as was its wont, with a motley throng of travelers, soldiers, hucksters, bargemen, and idlers of every nationality. Some stood about in the warm March sunshine, gossiping and laughing, over the latest scandal from the city. Others crowded the wine shops and places where hot victuals of all sorts were offered for sale, while others still anxiously watched the great highway, a triumph of human patience and skill, which stretched its broad and solid leagues away through the noisome Pomptine marshes. Before a small tavern on the main road, among other persons who were eagerly awaiting the incoming cohort of Julius, stood a group of five men and two women, their eyes fixed upon a distant cloud of dust, which evidenced the approach of a large body of foot and horse. Yes, cried one of the women, clasping her hands, while the tears streamed down her cheeks. It must be that they are coming, but how can we bear to see him in chains? Nay, my Priscilla, said her companion soothingly, let him not find thee in tears. Surely he will need all the cheer and comfort which we can bestow. Thou art right, my Junia. But see, it is the cohort. And the warm-hearted Priscilla started forward, as if she would have penetrated the serried ranks of legionnaires which now began to file past them. Yes, yes, there he is. See, my husband? Riding on the mule behind the two horsemen. My God, the chain, and oh, how old and worn. The cohort had come to a halt now, and the prisoners, each manacled to a soldier, and further guarded by a quartinian, were marched into the shelter of a shed nearby. Aquila lost no time in asking permission to speak to the prisoner Paulus and he was not a little comforted at the readiness with which his request was granted. Thou mayst speak with Paulus, said the centurion courteously, and I will also give orders that he be removed to a room in the inn, where he may further refresh himself in your good company. When the worn prisoner found himself once more among them that loved him, he thanked God and took courage. About ten miles further on, at a place called the Three Taverns, a second group of Christians was waiting to bid him welcome, and so along the Appian Way, where many a mailed warrior had ridden proudly with his conquering legions to celebrate his triumphs in Imperial Rome, came this scarred and wearied veteran, clad in the whole armor of God, the hero of the grandest triumph the world had ever witnessed, to receive the glorious crown of his reward past tombs and temples, past snug hamlets and marble palaces, embosomed in trees, past the Alban hills, across the famous viaduct of Erica, through the long rows of suburban villas, through the Porta Capina, with its vast arch perpetually dripping with the waters of the aqueduct which flowed above, under triumphal arches. Julius, and his prisoners marched on, till at length they reached the golden milestone of the Forum, the heart of the civilized world, the center and source of all earthly power and magnificence. From this golden milestone, 
radiated the shining roads which bound the distant provinces to the heart of the eternal city and about it clustered the historic buildings of the republic and the glittering courts of the golden house that wondrous palace of the caesars here julius delivered the persons of the prisoners into the charge of burrus the prefect of praetorians by his orders they were at once marched into the barracks of the imperial guard the centurion seemed in no haste to depart though his duty was now ended a word with thee most noble burrus he said before i leave the prisoners in thy charge there is among them a certain aged man named paulus who is innocent of any crime i myself heard his defence before festus and agrippa both of whom pronounced him not guilty but because he appealed to caesar they had no choice but to send him to rome he was first imprisoned in the days of felix through the spite and malice of the jews who hate him consumedly because he is what we call a christian but by all the immortals i swear that he is not only guiltless of any misdemeanor but that he is also a wise just and holy man whereupon he related all the circumstances of the voyage and shipwreck and also concerning the miracles performed among the inhabitants of malta therefore i pray you he said in conclusion show the man what favor you may and give him all the liberty possible under the law he will not abuse it this i can promise thee burris nodded his head understandingly it shall be as thou hast said my good julius i will look to it and so it came to pass that paul was allowed to dwell in lodgings by himself near the barracks the soldiers to whom he was chained also showed him such kindness as they were able and best of all he was permitted to receive his friends freely on the third day after his arrival he sent a message to the chief jews of rome asking them to assemble themselves at his house they came to a man for they were curious to look upon the famous apostate brethren began the prisoner regarding his countrymen with wistful eyes though i have committed no offence against israel nor against the customs of our fathers yet was i delivered chained from jerusalem into the hands of the romans and these when they had examined me would have set me free because i had done nothing worthy of death but when the jews opposed this i was forced to appeal unto caesar not that i had aught to accuse my nation of for this reason therefore i sent for you that i might see and speak with you for the hope of israel i am bound with this chain we have received no letters from judea concerning thee said one simon ben ishmael cautiously nor have any of the brethren who have recently visited us shown or spoken any evil of thee but we desire to hear what thou hast to say concerning this new faith for we know this much that the sect is everywhere spoken against a day was accordingly appointed and the jews flocked in great numbers to the house of paul that they might hear him expound the christian faith and he preached to them from morning until evening concerning jesus the christ backing up his words with the solemn testimony of the law and of the prophets and some believed the things which were spoken and some believed not at the last when the discussion waxed hot betwixt them many also mocking at the tale of the crucified christ paul dismissed them with that one weighty word of warning and reproof once uttered by jesus himself well spake the holy spirit by essius the prophet unto our fathers saying go unto this people and say hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand and seeing ye shall see and not perceive for the heart of this people is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing and their eyes have they closed 
lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and i should heal them be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of god is sent unto the gentiles and that they will hear it and when he had said these words writes luke the jews departed and had great reasoning among themselves then he brings his chronicle to an end with these significant words and paul dwelt two whole years in his own hired house and received all that came to him preaching the kingdom of god and teaching those things which concern the lord jesus christ with all confidence no man forbidding him of those years in rome there yet remains to us some slight record in the epistles written to his beloved churches in the Colossae, in ephesus and in philippi if he could not go to them himself they were yet willing messengers ready to bear his words of love and wisdom to the faithful in jesus christ and so though he knew it not this ambassador in bonds spoke to the church of all the ages unto me he writes who am less than the least of all saints is this grace given that i should preach among the gentiles the unsearchable riches of christ jesus our lord for this cause i bend my knees before the father of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named that he may grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man that christ may dwell in your hearts by faith that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able with all saints to comprehend the breadth and length and depth and height thereof and to know the love of christ which passeth knowledge that ye may be filled with all the fullness of god seldom in these letters does he refer to his helpless condition except by way of apology for his barely decipherable signature which was the token in every epistle not once does he bewail the injustice of his imprisonment nor ask that means shall be taken to bring about his release walk in wisdom towards them that are without he writes to the colossi redeeming the time let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man all that concerns me will be made known to you by tychius who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow-servant in the lord whom i have sent to you for this very end that he might learn your state and comfort your hearts with osemus the faithful and beloved brother your fellow countrymen they will tell you all that has happened here the salutation of me paul with my own hand remember my chain grace be with you what then had happened osemus the fugitive slave was about to return to Colossae to face the master for whom he had escaped so many years ago he had followed paul to rome and had attached himself to his person in the capacity of a humble attendant if thou art a slave of the lord jesus he said let me i pray thee be thy slave and paul had suffered him that he might the more readily impart to this darkened soul the teachings of the master but after a year had elapsed he spoke to him gently of his duty to the master whom he had so grievously wronged i will write he said a letter to philemon who also received the glad tidings with joy many years since he will receive thee from my hand no longer as a slave but as a brother which indeed thou hast been and art even a brother faithful and beloved osemus raised his head his face was white but determined and his eyes shone with the radiance of a great love i will do this thing he said in a low voice because thou hast bidden me and if i perish i perish note the law condemned the fugitive slave to death by crucifixion End note. nay my son said paul 
laying its chained hand on the bowed head. Thy master will receive thee as he would receive me, in all love and honor, for the sake of him who both died and hath given himself for us, even Christ our Lord. In his quarters near the barracks of the Praetorian Guard, under the very shadow of the Golden House, the aged prisoner could not have failed to hear frequent mention of the shameful and horrible events daily transpiring in that abode of blood and lust. He must have heard of the fatal ascendancy of the adulteress, Popea, whom the Jews now proudly claimed as a proselyte, of the banishment and the murder of the innocent Octavia, the lawful wife of the emperor, before whose tribunal he was soon to stand. But he makes no mention of these historic events in his letter to the Philippians, written at about this time, nor does he allude, except in the most casual manner, to the threatening aspect which his own affairs had assumed, owing to the death of the kind and honest Burrus, and the ascension to power of the infamous Tigellinius. Wherefore, my beloved, he writes, as you have always obeyed me, not as in my presence only, but how much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God that worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Do all things for the sake of good will, without murmurings and disputings, that you may be blameless and guiltless, the sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine like stars in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, and if my blood be poured forth, I rejoice for myself, and rejoice with you all. And do you likewise rejoice both for yourselves and with me? Toward the close of this epistle are found these significant words. All the saints salute you, especially they that are of Caesar's household. They of Caesar's household, the fierce veterans to whom he was chained, but who also were chained to him during many weary yet blessed hours, the slaves who crept to his feet for comfort and solace, the lowliest of the lowly, despised and downtrodden beneath the iron heel of infamy, yet brothers beloved and saints of God. Not many days after, the aged prisoner was called before the dread tribunal of Rome. Was he acquitted and released, or was he remanded to his prison there to languish for unknown months and years? We cannot tell. Volume after volume has been written on the subject. Wise men of every creed and nationality have discussed the question in all its varied aspects, but today we can only repeat the words we cannot tell. To Timothy, his dearly beloved son, Paul writes his last word, I adjure thee before God and Jesus Christ, who is about to judge the living and the dead. I adjure thee by his appearing and his kingdom, Proclaim the tidings. Be urgent in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all forbearance and perseverance in teaching. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them who love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come to me speedily, for Damas has forsaken me for the love of this present world, and hath departed to Thessalonica. Crescens is gone to Galatia, Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. When thou comest, 
Bring with thee the cloak that I left at Troyes, and the books, but especially the parchments. At my first answer no man stood with me, but all forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Nevertheless, the Lord Jesus stood by me, and strengthened my heart, that by me the heralding of the good tidings might be accomplished in full measure, and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the lion's mouth. For an instant the light shines full upon the heroic figure, then it disappears forever in the impenetrable mists of the years but not before we catch the triumphant words of farewell. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil, and shall preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory unto the ages of ages. Amen. End of